Boom. And we're live. Boom. Everybody, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Man with Purpose. Today, I have a special guest. His name is Michael Bates. Michael is an actor, a transformational coach, captain, a tribe men's community, and a men's work facilitator. Michael guides humans of all persuasions into the deepest embodiment of their highest potential. Michael, thank you very much for doing this, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Really excited for it today. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Um, I like to normally start these uh, conversations with just, you know, taking a, a, a deep breath and just doing a quick check in whatever is, whatever is present for you right now. So whenever you're ready, let's take a deep breath. Anything that is particularly coming up is, is being present for you or something that you want to share? Yeah, there's something, uh, I mean, it's always, it always makes me laugh. Something I first heard David Data say, it's actually where I, where I met Jackson and Justin was at uh, David Data's, I think it was his first men's retreat in like a decade that he did back in 2016. But he talked about the idea of having awareness of awareness. That sort of metacognitive awareness that so many of the the meditative traditions and you know the Vajrayana lineage that he comes out of, um, speaking about being able to watch your awareness. And I always laugh because you know I obviously work with men, and I love the way you started this podcast. I've never been on a podcast where someone started it the way I start every single coaching session, which wow. is with just three deep breaths, sometimes even up up to five minutes. But it's so incredible, right? Just taking a few seconds to just breathe center and suddenly it's like this whole universe opens up and like i tell guys it's like the more you do this the less time it takes to be able to find that place so that you can take it off the cushion you're in traffic you're with your girl you're in, you're in a situation in real life and it you know you get triggered or it blows you out or you're overwhelmed and suddenly you're back in the driver's seat. So I love that you started off that way. Um, yeah, it brings up everything. It, it brings up the moment. It brings up the present, the awareness of awareness. So thank you for doing that. Mm, no, no problem. I, um, I spoke with one of, the, one of the guests and uh, he said, you know, this is a great way to kind of open up a different space. You know, we're actually getting into a conversation, but oftentimes everybody's busy. Everybody kind of has their own lifestyle that, you know, um, everybody's kind of entangled and so it's good to kind of center and take a deep breath for a second and just like oh this is a different space we're entering so absolutely yeah. absolutely <laughs> right man I'm, I'm, I'm so curious to, to dive into this conversation um I, i'd like to know a little bit about about you and what was your you know what were you like as a child growing up as a young man and how did you find men's work so maybe let's start from there yeah, it's, it's a great place to start. Um, I grew up um, the, the child of two hippies. You know, my dad's a yoga teacher and a psychology teacher, he taught high school. He just retired last year. Congrats, dad, 49 Congrats. years. Uh, my mom was an actress and then uh, is a uh, natal astrologer, past life regressionist, and clinical hypnotherapist. So, uh, wow. yeah, all the things. <laughs> so I kind of grew up in this really interesting time. Um, with very open hippie parents, you know, it's like the generations usually, the generations usually alternate, right? So, um, sort of, uh, uh, we can dive into that whenever you're ready. I'm still recording. Yeah. So yeah, the child of hippie parents sort of, um, mm. given a very wide spread, you know, do whatever you want, be whatever you want to be. Um, I hit this height at 14, I'm six, five. So um, I was uh, an amazing musician and also an athlete. Um, that was sort of, when I grew up, I knew I was going to be an NBA basketball player and a jazz saxophone player, like together. <laughs> I was going to be like that person, you know? <laughs> and um, so from out of the gate, you know, I grew up uh, in a lot of sort of different worlds. I grew up in this very um, aggressive athletic space with sort of these stereotypical drill sergeant coaches that were, you know, really had an impact on me and not in the best of ways. I think a lot of us that grew up playing sports, a lot of guys had that type of experience, you know, that for me definitely traumatized 
me in a big way. I'd never, I'd never been yelled at by an adult before. And suddenly I've got this man who's supposed to be my coach just screaming in my face. And I'd kind of, you know, yeah, fade out. Right. Wow. I, I'm sure there's tons of guys and so many guys that I talk to sort of having that challenging experience playing organized sports. Um, but then on the other side, I was in the sort of musical realm as well. So I was sort of with the nerds, the sort of those types of uh, people that are more on the sensitive, vulnerable, expressive um, state. You know, a lot of my friends that came out later as being gay, you know, who in high school are having a really rough time in the 90s. So I sort of had a foot in both worlds uh, in, a, in a really wonderful way and kind of tried to keep the peace between those, those two worlds in the hallways wow. of my high school. Um, but I grew up, you know, this sort of postmodern moment that we're sort of waking up to realizing what we're in. And as far as the necessity of changing things, changing our ideas of gender dynamics and these types of things, but also the people that are getting sort of left behind on both sides of the equation. So, um, for me, it's been, it was a real struggle. You know, I wasn't until I encountered data's work and his whole centering on purpose, like as a man, you need to discover your purpose. That doesn't mean obviously that a woman can't have a purpose, but that for the quote unquote masculine, or as Justin likes to say, the alpha, having a purpose, having a mission, having a drive that you're focusing on. Um, after high school, basketball and music sort of fell away as I went into college and sort of the real world hit me and the necessities of what it would take to actually be a, you know, um, an NBA basketball player as an only six foot five white boy without the best jump, you know, it's like, and not hands big enough to palm a ball. It's like, well, you know, you're maybe okay. not going to get as far as you want it to get. So um, from the time I was 19 until I hit about 35, um, I was kind of just floating and I didn't really know that I was floating, but I knew that I was searching for something. I knew I was looking for my purpose. And, you know, when you're young, people are like, oh, don't worry, you've got plenty of time. You'll figure it out. Well, I hit, you know, 30 shows up and I'm like, okay, where's my purpose? I did find, I did find acting. You know, I, I went to acting school. I went to theater school in New York City uh, at the famous William Esper studio and studied with him. He just passed a couple years ago. Um, but was able to study with one of the greats and that sort of became my purpose. It was, it was a spiritual practice. It was the, the art of living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Wow. So I love that. People have this idea about acting that you're up there faking it, but real actors, um, they're not faking it. They're having a genuine experience internally that shows up externally as maybe something different, but it's, you're very much going through something. And it was in that moment that I learned that my life on stage was more authentic than my life off stage. Wow. That I was bringing more truth to my fictional characters than I was bringing to my own life. So it became this, I just dove in. I just head first, just dove in. I was in the master class after I graduated with, for two years with Bill. Um, but what I ran up to, or I should say ran up against was, um, as all actors run up against, it's like you're out of school now go try enjoy with all the, the million other aspiring actors, you know, that sort of catch 22 dilemma of you can't really get to the auditions without having an agent, but how do you get an agent without getting into the auditions? And, you know, I really didn't have the spirit um, that I think I have now to, to know how to fight, to know how to sort of beat the streets and hit the pavement. I very much um, in a lot of my behavior and growing up, um, didn't really know how to assert myself very well. Didn't really know how to do that. And again, how do you do that? It's not like it's an A plus B equals C type of an equation. It's like, how do I go about doing this? So I spent a number of years sort of struggling to be an actor, um, but never able to fully pay the bills. It's like, you know, I always joke uh, with actors, it's either you're, star you're, you're a starving artist or you've got millions of dollars in the bank. There's not a lot of space in mm -hmm. between. Um, so yeah, I, I bartended for years in New York. I was in the nightlife scene and sort of bringing my meditation practices behind the bar at 4am and all wow. these things. Yeah. Trying to be of service and growing up as, you know, the parent, again, the, the, the child of these hippie parents and bringing my yogic studies to that. But it was, it was about 35 that, that it really hit me hard in a big way of like, okay, I'm 35 now. 
Where is my purpose? Where mm. is, and just, and not knowing again that that's what was missing, but just having this sort of agonizing feeling. I think that's the midlife crisis in a way. But um, that was when men's work showed up. A friend of mine handed me a book um, called Iron John by Robert Bly, yeah. which is to this day my favorite book. I read that book and I had what I can only describe as psychedelic experiences in reading that book. It was so profound to me. Um, wow. Would literally just open up streams of thought and consciousness around this whole idea and everything just made sense. Like suddenly my life started to make sense and um, I just knew I had to do this work. So I just, I dove into Joseph Campbell. I dove into uh, Mircea Eliade, um, all religious studies, comparative religion, mythology, anthropology, history, just whoa, 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 whoa. where something just got unlocked there. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Got and um, I'm a 12 year burner. So I go burning man is part of my religion. You might, you might say um, this was five years ago that um, I just knew I got a message from, I don't know, from spirit, from whatever you want to call it, that I, I needed to create and lead a, a, a men's rite of passage at Burning Man that year. How am I going to do that? Who do I think I am? I don't know what I'm doing. Who am I to presume to do this? I just read some books and you know whatever. But um, so I started putting together this idea of what I was going to do, this two hour ritual from all these sort of different cultures that I've been studying and ideas that why men in the modern world are struggling so much is that we we don't have the ritual. We don't have the ritual that for thousands of years, no matter where your genetics come from, no matter what color skin you have, whatever religion you are, if you go back far enough, we all come from these tribal societies where there were specifically these adolescent rites of passage and this idea that boys don't, just become men they have to be turned into men and they have to be turned into men by other men so guys like joseph campbell robert bly a lot of these people really look at the crisis in modern masculinity as the result of the loss of these rituals the loss of these traditions specifically that adolescent rite of passage mm -hmm. where there's an ordeal that the young men are taken through there's an ordeal that they have to go through and in so many of these ancient rituals there's a scarification like one of the aboriginal tribes knocks out one of the t one of the incisors ritualistically there's oh, wow that you have to go through because guess what life is pain and suffering you know the first precept of the buddha you know life is suffering um and we're going to teach you how to how to hold that how to how to take that pain how to take your suffering and move forward with that nobly carrying the cause for for your community for your tribe for yourself and we don't have that and it was like oh my god like that's what i never got that's what i never had that's the thing that's missing that's the piece that's missing and then right as i'm getting ready to go into into the desert to try to do this work someone hands me a copy of the way of the superior man by david data <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> and i literally that weekend, it was, that was a Friday night. I did not, I got up from my computer to sleep and to use the bathroom and to eat. And I literally devoured every video, everything of David's online that I could find. Every single thing, every, 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 every single thing. And it was at that point I looked him up and saw that he was doing this men's work thing in the, in the fall, in October of 2016. And I signed up. It was way more money than I had at the time. I was like, fuck it, just, I'm going. But I went to Burning Man and I did this ritual and I almost didn't do it because I was so scared, you know, I was so afraid. Um, you know, Justin talks about, uh, Justin Patrick Pierce, one of my mentors and one of the founder of Tribe Men's Community, um, talks about the fear compass and that, you know, a saber toothed tiger or, you know, a, a robber down a dark alley is a type of fear that you should avoid. Like move away from that fear. But there's another type of fear that is purpose fear. That's the, the fear that comes up when you've, you're facing something that you know you need to do, but is terrifying because what does it mean if I do this? What does it mean if I do this and I fail? What does it mean if I do this and I succeed? So I mm. went into the desert and um, 
was literally about to quit. And one of my boys showed up and was like, there's just no way I'm not, I am not going to let you not do this. I know how important it is. So right. Men's work in action. Right. And, um, me and him and a couple guys from my camp, we, we rode out to, uh, to the temple. If you guys are familiar with Burning Man, they set up the, this big, beautiful temple. That's like a, it's non-denominational. It's a place to come and mourn and, and feel the, the darker side of things, the, the, the death side of the life side that is all the Burning Man and the party and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I did this ritual for, for two hours. I don't remember much of it. I was sort of in a trance. <laughs> Um, but I know at the end there was about 28 guys. We were all in tears and it was, um, I just knew that was it. I knew I had to do this. I, I didn't know how I had done what I just did. I just knew I had to sort of continue doing it. And, um, yeah, so that was sort of how it started. And then it's, it's moved, it's moved on a bit from there to say the least, but I'll, I'll end, I'll end that long, very long answer to your question. No, that was great. I mean, there's so many things that we can, we can unpack there. Um, it's funny you say Aaron John, I just received a copy just literally an hour ago of Aaron John just to keep it because I've been listening to it, reading it online, but it, there's something different when you have the book. So highly recommend it to everybody just listening right now. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. That's so important. <laughs> yeah. I, um, you know, we, we kind of touched upon because th there seems to be this kind of theme of everybody that I speak to right around maybe their late twenties, early thirties, something doesn't, I guess like, Oh, something is missing here. Do, do you think is the, it's a big question. I understand that. Do you think rituals alone is what's missing for men's men today? Or is there, mm. it's maybe it's a compounded effect of other things that are happening today in the culture, society, et cetera, et cetera. That's a really good question. I think, I think it's a lot of things. I think rit the absence of ritual is a big piece of it. I think, mm. again, men need a mission. The masculine element of a human being needs a mission. It needs something to, being, to pursue. And you know, we saw so many instances in the 20th century of that being twisted with uh, the Nazis on the far right and then the, the Soviets on the far left. The abuse of the, the desire of men to create something, to build something, to be a part of something, to connect. It's, it's why the military has the pull that it does. And in, in beautiful ways, it's not all bad by any means. So I think we're missing ritual. I think there's something that happened with the industrial revolution historically, you know, back in the late 1800s where men were, and this is what Bly talks about and Campbell a lot as well, but that the men had been sort of in the home and sort of, we were still more agrarian in our, in our, in our culture and in, in most places in the world. And the man was more present in the family unit until really this sort of industrial revolution pulled the man out of the family, out into the office, out into really out into the mines, out into these really intense conditions where he was gone for most of the day, coming back later, tired, overworked, what have you. And so um, an imbalance that started to happen in the familial unit where it was sort of, not intentionally and not that it's a bad thing, but that it was sort of dominated more by the feminine, by the mothers who were there home with the, with the kids more than the dads were present. So I think that's a part of it. I think there's, um, I'm a big historian again. And I think we really, again, it, what's, what's so amazing about data is, you know, data was studying epigenetics before he sort of got into what he got into. And I know that that mm. was a part of, his sort of motivation and, and, and a, a piece of around, around his own discoveries, but that epigenetically, we know now that um, things move through the generations, that, that traumas get passed down. And, you know, there's never been arguably a more traumatic century than the 20th century and what just happened. So I think men, there's so much talk now about patriarchy and, you know, men are to blame and we've been oppressing women for all time. And, Yes, there has been that for sure. I don't think it's been all oppression and, you know, I, whoever has that idea, I, it's, it's, just, it's just a really cynical idea. It's like, you know, men and women have been living together most of the time, um, just trying to survive and bearing their children along the way, like working together. I, 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 yes, there's been a lot of negative stuff that's happened towards women, but for the last 5,000 years, men have been just getting annihilated on battlefields across the planet, just looking historically. And then again to the 20th century where 
men were brought in droves by the masculine leadership, by their fathers, by the generals, by the leaders of the nations. They were brought onto battlefields and they were annihilated, just annihilated in the worst possible way. So I think that's in our psyche. I think there's a mistrust of the masculine from the masculine. Mm. I think, you know, we, we, we think about patriarchy and we think it's only women that have been impacted by that. Men have been impacted by that, whatever that even means, patriarchy, right? Because it's become such a generalized term. Yeah. And honestly, it bothers me because what does that mean? All, all, all male leadership is bad? Absolutely not. That's not true. Mm. Has a lot of it been bad? Yeah. And obviously that's a whole other, whole other topic mm-hmm. we, can, we can dive into. But there's so many different pieces. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of it is that I, the, the men that I work with and the men that I see, and especially in the communities in the more burning man, conscious living communities that the men have taken um, steps to really listen to women and to sort of soften themselves, to become vulnerable, to become sensitive, to grow their hair long and, you know, wear more feminine things, which is beautiful in a way, but I think they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. In, in a way. So there's the ferocity, the, the, the tenacity, the, the spirit, the fighting spirit of men, um, at least in a lot of ways and from a lot of men, I'm just speaking from my own experience, what I've seen mm-hmm. has been lost in exchange for the softness. So I see a lot of, a lot of hardcore dudes, like, you know, in, I mean, you see them a lot on, on the mat, right? Where it's yeah. sort of like that uber masculine, people are going all the way in one extreme, or they're going all the way soft in the other extreme. The work that I do is to bring those together, is mm-hmm. to medicinally apply the, the qualities that that man in this case, but any human, um, but specifically men, need to balance themselves out. So for example, if it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll use a generalized stereotype here, you know, a long haired hippie guy. Um, the quality that he probably needs. The assignment I would give him would be to go join you on the Brazilian jiu-jitsu mat for the weekend Mm. and bring out that quality. You know, for some of those guys that you roll around with all the time, I would invite them to a five rhythms class. I would invite them to a conscious dance class where they get to sort of move and connect with that other side of themselves. Mm. Mm. It's a multi-varied issue. and, And I think that's why we're struggling with it so much. It's not a simple answer. There's so many factors contributing to it. And obviously we could talk about it all day and please feel free to, <laughs> to, to cut me off or stop me if I keep going. But no, no, no. I, I think you're pretty passionate about this stuff. I can see that. Like you're spitting out fire. I love that. I yeah. love that. Um, you know, just to touch upon something which you said, and I think it's it's important that we should do it justice. I think I think there is a lot of propaganda around uh, patriarchy being, and I don't want to get political, but there is, I think, a lot of kind of narrative patriarchy being to blame for everybody. This kind of shame and guilt being passed over to men, which I think yeah. you rightly pointed out, both men and women have been impacted. Mm-hmm. And once one step further, and this is maybe my kind of thinking, and I'm in my own head maybe too much, but I don't really see. I don't really think we see much patriarchy. Even we see more, and at least from what I've seen, and I'm even thinking about maybe writing a book at some point later in mm. a couple of years. We actually see a lot more poorky, which is this kind of rule of boys. As, you know, um, adult male human beings with the psyche of a 12-year-old, 13-year-old running the Absolutely. country, running the world. Absolutely. And like. It's, you know, it's very disconnected. I think most people don't really understand this notion of mature masculine. They see just a, a, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 year old man. Oh yeah, he's a man. There's a huge difference there. People don't really get that. So I I just want to put in this, in in this deck, because I think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a great book, um, King Warrior Magician Lover by Robert Moore. Mm. Um, And uh, I think Gillette is the guy. I have it right here, actually. Oh, Uh, yes. Douglas Gillette, yeah. Um, Which is one of those sort of quintessential men's work tomes from the 90s, you know, that sort of 90s MKP Mankind Project, who, again, I I really recommend them to. Very different from Data's work. Together, they're a good combination. But that whole idea of, yeah, what, what is being referred to at, in the negative, in the pejorative sense, when people say patriarchy, is really the shadow masculine component of the out of integrity uh, qualities of, yeah, that sort of childish man-child 
experience that again, if, if the men, if the boys haven't been turned into men, if they haven't been taught or, or taken through something that gives them the embodied lived experience of going through something, I was a boy. Now I'm a man. Why? Because I went through this and I've got the scar to prove it that there's, yeah. How, how do we, what is the thing that, that transfers the, 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 the childish psyche into the, into the mature psyche? You know, Jung writes a lot about this as well. And I think that's it. We've got a lot of, of man children running around, um, cleaving to power in the way that uh, a child does in the way that an immature child does. So you have like the, the, the high chair tyrant is one of the terms yeah. that um, Robert Moore uses for that energy, you know, that energy that hasn't been um, matured, that hasn't mm -hmm. been distilled into something mm -hmm. greater. So. And that's really what I see us collectively as, you know, men leader facilitators etc we're doing is we're kind of uh kind of co-stewarding if you will the return of the the father archetype kind of the mature masculine yes. and you know yes. everybody's on their own journey myself included I'm, I'm far from you know thinking that they have all the answers but i really do think that uh, personally for me the buck stops with me like whatever trauma we're even talking with my girlfriend about this that i'm carrying from my father, my grandfather, you know, ancestral trauma, it kind of stops with yeah. me. And then I want to make sure that I'm kind of, uh, you know, enter a new generation. Uh, mm -hmm. if I'm lucky enough to be a father one day just to pass on, not, not pass over these traumas because I think, yeah, it's important. And we need, uh, and we need more fathering in the world is where I was going with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, there's an idea from neuro linguistic programming that you're always, you're always learning. You can't not be learning. And something we talk about in tribe a lot. I think Michael Holt was the guy I first heard say it, but you know, we're always practicing something. You know, mm -hmm. if I sit at my computer slouched over like this every day, I'm practicing this posture. And then over time that becomes, you know, yeah, <laughs> the way I am. So there's something about that that is really amazing that, you know, you can always be doing something and moving towards something, but that for, for boys, it's like, I don't remember where I heard this. Maybe it was, it might've been Jordan Peterson, but maybe it was someone in that vein of, you know, boys are going to join a gang, you know, whether that's Florida State University or the BJJ, you know, uh, Brazilian team at your gym or the Bloods and the Crips, they're going to join a gang. That's in the nature, that's in the nature of humans really, but, but specifically in this case, boys, to latch on to other people that are those father figures, especially with the just dirge of um, single mother, you know, uh, amazing warrior, single mothers raising boys by themselves. Yeah, you know, that the importance, yeah, the importance of having that. And even for those of us that did have fathers around like I did, you know, the nuclear family, it's like, you know, you're lucky if you have one dad, but even if you have one dad, you only have one model for masculinity growing up. Mm -hmm. Your model for God, for the masculine God that you're going to try to become is dad. So it's that old saying from the Bible, the sins of the father are revisited on the son. Whatever your dad wow. didn't sort out in his life, now it gets passed on to you through his behaviors or his mm -hmm. um, traumas or his difficulties, his alcoholism or whatever it is that he's struggling with. So again, in the tribal era, you know, you had all these, or for those of us who are still have, come from larger families, you've got uncles, mm -hmm. you've got cousins, you've got all these different, you know, I, I grew up, I, I grew up thinking that I had an uncle when I didn't, it was actually my mom's best friend, um, wow. my uncle Larry, and uh, it was my mom's gay best friend. I didn't know he wasn't my uncle till I was older, but just having his, his way of being a man. You know, this unique flavor of man who happened to be gay. I got this, and guess what? It didn't make me gay to grow up around that type of energy. But I got to see a different way of being a man because of the friends, my parents' friends that came in. So it's so important to have community. There's that, um, I think it's an African proverb. I don't want to fuck it up because I hear it all the time. But it's like, if you, if you don't initiate the men, the boys, you know, if you don't initiate the young men, they'll burn down the village just to feel the warmth. Wow. Just to feel the warmth. So it's like that scene in Batman, right? It's the Joker. It's, it's the unfathered boy that grows up and is just 
so traumatized that he doesn't care. He's going to bring the whole system down because mm -hmm. the system has failed him. So I think that's what we see in the rise of nihilism to the extreme that we have it. The, the extremity of depression and anxiety that we have, particularly gripping men, um, because there's just this sense of, well, what the fuck does it even matter? You know? And that, the, the postmodern idea of, well, everything is valid, everything is correct, everything has a meaning, everything, you know, there's no way to choose one over the other, hierarchy is bad, you know. It's, I mean, fuck. I, I struggle with this stuff every day and I've devoted my life to these studies. And so yeah. there are people out there like I was when I was young that, that don't know what's happening, but there's mm -hmm. an absence, as you said so beautifully, the, the father energy. Wow. You know, you're saying a couple of things, especially what you mentioned from the Bible and the father and son. I'm just kind of thinking about still listening, but also thinking about how there's a lot of resemblance between the, uh, issues that I'm kind of battling and grappling with mm -hmm. and my father also did even though we didn't really specifically talk about it we kind of touched upon some of these topics but man it's so true uh, yeah. but I think that the mic is kind of getting caught up in your shit so it's um, oh is it yeah a little bit uh, there we go I think it's better <laughs> uh, you are so much you're in, into your kind of groove yeah, yeah, in I, the floor. Little, uh, I didn't want to no but that's great man I love <laughs> I love the kind of the raw real raw and relevant content you're just yeah. kind of spitting out it's amazing um it, you know what i'm kind of on the same on this, kind of on the same side as you are like how do we build community where how do we start if, if i'm a young man and i'm listening right now maybe i'm a, have a little bit of a i'd say nihilistic viewpoint on the world what do i do where do i go where, where are all the masculine role models right there's, there's i mean i can think of very few apart from all the guests that i'm interviewing what, what do you if, you know if you're a young man right now what what advice would, would you give them that's a wonderful question um when i was 20 i discovered i i watched the movie ghost dog i don't know if you've seen it no with whitaker where he plays uh essentially a modern samurai and it's based on a book uh, called uh, the Hagakure. It means hidden leaves. It's uh, by Yamamoto Sunetomo. It's called the Book of the Samurai. It's a book of sort of phrases that this young samurai um, gleaned from his teacher. His teacher was forbidden from ritually disemboweling himself from committing seppuku when his master died. So he went to a, he was permitted to go to a monastery and become a monk. Hmm. And this young man would come to the old man and they would have these conversations. And this book is essentially the nuggets that the young samurai wrote down from this old guy. Oh. And um, one of them was, is hilarious to me because it's, it's like written in like 15th century Japan. But what the, this old samurai is basically saying is the same thing that all of our grandpas say, right? It's like, oh, this generation today, you know, there's, they're weak, they're soft. There's no real samurai today anymore. It's all garbage. So for you, it really sucks because you're a young samurai and, you know, there are no men of renown anymore to look to to model yourself. So the, the, the advice that he gives this young samurai is to make a model for himself from different samurai. So find a samurai that has really good sword technique and study with him. Find another one that has a really strong meditation practice and study with him. So my advice to young men today would be the same advice that this samurai was giving his his pupil um, find qualities out there if you can't find someone that embodies all of the qualities and that's a hard thing to do find the qualities that you are drawn to in someone and make a model of that you know almost like like a like a good frankenstein you know like a, like a like a nice frank like, like pull what you need and sort of build that but Find something that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be the thing. This is, you know, if I could jump in a time machine and go back and jump out in, you know, yeah, 1994, talk to me at 14, this is what I would say. I'm like, listen, find just one thing that you're interested in and pursue that and pursue it and pursue it and pursue it with as much energy and, and authenticity as you can. That might not be the thing that you end up doing, but the process of moving from the inertia, the place that you are right now, what do I do? I don't know, there's all these things. I mean, 
There's a million different things I could be doing. There's a million different podcasts out there. How do I spend my time? It's that, that, um, you know, options. There's so many options now. It's mm -hmm. like the inertia that comes from too much choice. Find one thing, start pursuing that. And in the process of pursuing it, this thing will either turn into something else. It'll take you to the path that you're meant to go, or you'll realize that as that is the thing, but it's actually over here. So you'll move and adjust, move and adjust, mm -hmm. move and adjust, mm -hmm. but take that first step, take that first step, take that first step. And, yeah. and yeah, empower yourself and, and don't think you have to build Rome in a day. Do it. Do See it. that that's the thing, right? Just be patient, consistency. And that, that's how I measure su success. Not so much the outcome that I'm getting, but the fact that I'm showing up every single day, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's, you know, doing the podcast, whatever. Um, I think that that's so much under underlooked. I think today, uh, and I'm guilty of that for sure. Sometimes I want everything to happen yesterday, but it's it's not like that. No, it's <laughs> it's not. And you know, we're in this time now where there's so much available to us, and the internet, and so much information, and sort of the the modeling that we're getting from, I think, specifically like the tech field and these sort of successful entrepreneurial. Um, mm men is work, 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 work. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the old idea that our parents and grandparents sort of had of um, grind, grind to the bone, work hard, work long hours, do what you can. And I think there's this sort of, nobody's taking a break. Nobody's resting because if you do, then that, that next startup is going to pass you. That one's going to do this. So it's like, I see such frenetic, energy from men and a hyper focus on the on the future is what creates anxiety in the system a hyper focus on past is what creates depression in the system so i see a lot of men where they're either stuck in one of those two places they're fixated on the past what did i do wrong i spent most of my life in that place um yeah right feeling those depressive um feelings or hyper anxious hyper sort of going, 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 going. How can I do more? How can I do more? Nootropics, you know, uh, all the different ways to stack things up. And, and it's great. But at the same time, what I love about what we do at Tribe and what I love about, you know, my own practices is that I've found for my creative work when I'm trying to write an article or I'm trying to do something, taking the time to actually sit and meditate and do nothing even if like we did at the beginning of this podcast for 10 seconds brings me back into a being state instead of a doing state. And from the being state, I get sort of a natural momentum that throws me into the doing state, kind of like that bounce on the bench press. Or if you're, if you're doing powerlifting on the squat, that I, there's a technical term for it. I forget it, but it's that, that bounce that you get off of the muscle, mm. um, that reflex that happens that I found when I do that being practice first, a stillness practice before I go into action, then I, there's a momentum, there's an engine behind me that I'm able mm -hmm. to, to step into whatever it is that I'm doing in a better way. So. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, this can't be said, I can't say enough about this. And I think sometimes people overlook the fact that something so simple uh, can actually yield such results. Like you said, the more you oh, commit yeah. yourself to something and the more you be make it into a practice and you do it, the value tends to increase over time as Absolutely. opposed to, oh, what's the new technique and, you know, tell me this and like it's something else. Yeah, comes everyone up like, wants to hack. Everyone wants the next thing. It's the next ad on Facebook that's targeting the newest thing of the newest thing of the newest thing. Listen, man, I went to India in 2010. I went to all the pilgrimage sites. I meditated under the Bodhi tree and got eaten alive by mosquitoes. And all I learned basically was that I thought I had to go to India and find a guru and stand on my head for six months to be able to achieve what is available to you right now in the simplicity, the infuriating simplicity of, again, what Justin Patrick Pierce said to me, change your breath, change your posture, you change your life. Wow. You literally change your life. Mm. You start to bring meta awareness, like we talked about at the beginning, right? To the way you're sitting. You know, I could be, you know, I could be doing this podcast like this. There's nothing wrong with this technically, but it, it's very different than if I'm just, if I'm here, it's just different. 
there's nothing wrong with, you know, well, I won't say there's nothing wrong with breathing shallowly, but when you learn to breathe, when you learn different breathing techniques, and there's thousands of breathing techniques to heat the breath, to cool the breath, to slow you down, to speed you up, all the different things. We do a lot of Wim Hof breath, the try, which mm. is a ton of fun and a great way to challenge yourself. It's, it's a death practice. It's a way to bring in the fear of death in a very safe way. For those wow. of you who've done it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, what are you waiting for? <laughs> mm. There we go, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember who, who said this, but you know, the, the path is the shortcut. The, the taking, you know, there is no shortcut. Yeah. So just continue doing the work every single day, show up, and that, that's, that's kind of the shortcut. But it's a little bit counterintuitive for people to think that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I know I for sure struggled with that. I thought that, you know, it would take me a lifetime, if not more, to be able to meditate properly or, you know, all the different ways that I think at least for me, I, I struggled with spirituality and um, creating a savior complex and all these different things that happen when you're young and you don't have tutelage, when you don't have guidance, when you don't have the mentor. Again, something that Bly and all these guys talk about is, you know, I'm just, we're just talking about men. So there's, there's, there's obviously, a, there's a path for women too. And my partner actually, Touch Koppel, she works specifically with women. So we get to sort of tag nice. team. But, for, for men, for boys, you know, you start off in your mother's house and then you go to your father's house and then you go to the mentor's house. You have to learn, you have to leave the family in a healthy way to go out into the world, to find the mentors, to be able to teach you, to, to move you into things. We used to have much more of that in our, in our culture and in our mm -hmm. societies than we do now. So there's, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot of guys sort of floating around not able to find the, you know, struggling to find the thing that they're looking for, thinking it has to be super complicated, mm, mm. but it really is. It really is very simple. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was infuriating. It was infuriating <laughs> because I'd yeah. literally been around the world looking for this stuff. I literally went to the places. I went to the sites. I, I did the stuff, but I never mm. really did the stuff, which is sit your ass on a cushion and feel what comes up. I think, again, I'm just going to quote Justin all day, but again, he's my mentor for a reason. Um, if you think you're a badass, you know, if you can get on the mat and roll around with the best, you can get and argue and make all this money. You think you're a badass, go try to sit still in a room for an hour in, in, in silence and sit in that for an hour and just sit and just watch and just watch what comes up and the ability to be able to do that is if you can develop that quality that translates into anything that you're doing it translates into art it translates into stock and finance it translates into sex and how you are with your partner it's mm. it's it's it is the superpower that everyone's looking for mm. and attention the ability to pay attention we call it paying attention for a reason right it's really interesting why do we say that pay attention i never thought about it that way yeah it's the most valuable masculine resource when men realize that that their attention and what they're willing to put their attention on or not put their attention on is the most valuable thing they have things will change like that and when men realize that a conscious man a man who is trying to be and i don't mean in the hippie sense i mean a man who is trying to bring more of himself to the world to combat that sort of stereotypical masculine shadow of disconnection to try to connect themselves to bring themselves back a conscious man is the most valuable commodity on this planet right now i lead workshops all the time i never hear groups of men saying where are all the conscious women out there all the conscious men i know have girlfriends or are married but i have throngs of women conscious women that are saying, where are all the conscious men? Where are all the conscious men? Where are all the conscious men that don't have partners? So men, <laughs> get your shit together, man. Yeah, the, world, man. the world is waiting for you. Wow. Man, I, I wish I had this conversation with you 10, 10 years ago. Like that, that's exactly <laughs> what I was doing. Oh man. I remember going to my first mentor. He's like, at the time he was like James Hutchinson. He was like uh, teaching oh, yeah. neuro linguistic programming. Sure. Sure. Like, wow. Okay. That's the thing. I just went there and for the, for the next maybe two and a half years, I showed up every single weekend. I was there present, you know, facilitating a little bit, stepping on the stage, et cetera, et cetera. And 
that led me to becoming better with women, which I didn't really resonate, and then how to be a better man to men's work. So that's kind of the, the journey that I hope from hop from one stone to another to another to arrive where I am. So there's mm. a there's a short example for for everybody that's listening right now. Yeah, I love that. Well, we're kind of touching on the subject, so we might as well dive deep into this a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about the value of having a mentor, especially as a young man, someone that can kind of guide you and show you a little bit of how things work in the world? Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything more valuable mm. than that. I think that is infinitely more valuable than a trust fund that has $5 million in it. Infinitely more valuable. Um, there's a, there's a reason money only tends to last three generations before it gets squandered because the person that's spending it is not the person that made it with the same amount of intelligence and wherewithal that created it. So the importance of having a mentor, I think, is, is literally everything. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to have the same mentor. But again, you know, in, in acting school and in screenwriting and um, Joseph Campbell's work, they use the Star Wars theme as sort of the the playbook for the hero's journey for that 12 step process that is the the macro cosmic mirror for the microcosmic journey that every single man goes through and um my my lady is is working on the the, the heroine's journey there's an amazing book maureen murdoch for those of you for any women listening that talks about the heroine's journey um it's it's different it's a different thing but for men this journey is, it's happening whether you're aware of it or not. That's the thing. It's just, it's the formula. It's, it's, we've, enough human history has happened and enough lives have been lived to, to recognize that there are themes that are happening. So to, the, I, I always like to ask this way, how far would Luke Skywalker have gotten without Obi-Wan Kenobi? In that, in that quintessential moment when he's in the cockpit getting ready to pull the trigger to blow up the Death Star, whose voice comes into his head and tells him to do basically what you just told me to do at the beginning of this call. Relax. Take a deep breath. Use the force. What the fuck do you think the force is? <laughs> it's you. It's, it's your force. It's the directed attention of your consciousness that comes out in the way you learn to use it like a tool, like a weapon. So finding a mentor for men is absolutely crucial. Um, and it's something that, you know, this is a whole other topic, but you know, so many of the, we, we've lost the elders in our society. So many of our mentors are languishing in old folks' homes. So many of our mentors are not being honored in the way that they were once honored and aren't being given the opportunity to pass on what they've learned to the next generation. So the advice is generally, if for, for a young man, if there's, if there's a man that you admire, if there's an older man that you admire or someone that's doing work that you want to do, ask them, ask them, actually ask them if they would mentor you. Use that word. There's something about it. I mean, if you're really a master of your craft or you're really involved in something or you're really passionate or you're really good at it. You know, my, my dad does this all the time. All the mentors that I've had, all the older men in MKP or people that have been around. When I ask them, what is being a man all about? They say one thing, service, service, service. It's about being of service, um, you know, being of service to those around you. And so, older men want to pass on their knowledge. They want someone to teach. They want, Dave Burns, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna collect, I'm just gonna get everyone in and drive. Dave Burns, who was my first coach, who's, I don't know what Dave Burns is. He's an alien. He's, <laughs> he's the reincarnation of, of Socrates himself, honestly. Um, and and I've, <laughs> I've gotten so excited about Dave that I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> sure I love your energy, around. man. I'm sure it'll come back around. Um, what would you, do you mind just presencing me back to what we were just talking about? Yeah, just the, the 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 value of having a mentor and how men want to be of service. Older men want to be of service. That that was kind yeah. of where we're going with this, and how we've lost all the elders. Um, yeah, you kind of 
giving a little bit more about your experience with with your mentors you know in tribe and also before that yeah being of service being of service so giving older men the opportunity or older women you know for god's sakes like it doesn't just have to be we're, we're talking men's work so we're mm. I mean, we're using these terms and um i think it's just for for young men go and talk to older men and ask ask for mentorship ask mm. for what it is that you need um dave is really inspiring to me because dave always um and he can stop me if this has changed but i doubt that it has um always has um a pro bono client that he works with oh, it's usually someone younger it's usually someone that doesn't have the financial means to 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 pay what dave is worth on <laughs> in, in dollars and cents but that it was just so inspiring that you know ask don't be afraid to ask for what you want and if you get the answer that you don't want ask someone else i call that my paris rule i was um <laughs> I was backpacking in Europe in 2006 and I was in Paris. I was trying to get a ticket to go to Pamplona, Spain to run with the bulls. And everybody told me that the trains are full. You can't go. You can't go. And I'm like, I've been waiting all my life to go run with the freaking bulls. I'm not going to not go. And I kept going to different, ant to different windows to buy a ticket and the, the rude French people, cause I didn't speak French and granted that's, that's my bad, but we're like, no, there's no tickets. There's no tickets. And I was like, Oh, should I go home? Should I just leave? What should I do? And I looked and I saw a window with a, a, a British, the British flag on it, implying that they spoke English. And I went over and it was like the eighth person that I asked. And they're like, oh, actually, there is. That's the last train right there for the day. If you can catch it, you can get there. And it was like a scene from a movie. I literally, with my 75 liter backpack on, I ran through the train station. <laughs> As the train was pulling off, I grabbed on the back, literally, and pulled myself up. Wow. Went to Pamplona, ran with the bulls. Maybe it was a bad idea that I that I went because I ended up getting stepped on and cracked oh, the rib. But, dude. Um, oh wow! Yeah, but it's that thing, right? It's that the tenacity of not quitting. If this is your dream, if this is what you want to do, the universe is going to test you. It's gonna it's gonna say, "Is this really your dream? Are you sure? Are you mm. sure?" It's going to put obstacles in your path because obstacles are how we grow. Failure is how we grow. Struggle is how we grow. Mm. So young men like yeah ask 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 mm. yeah. wow beautiful beautiful wow um that also leads me to another question what do you think we as men today can do to support you know future generations maybe kids that are kind of listening to this or young men etc teenagers if you will yeah. what can we do as, as men you can do your own work you can do what you can to make sure that you, again, back to that quote from the Bible, the sins of the father, mitigate your sins. Um, and I don't say sin in a, in a religious context. You know, in the Greek, it means to miss the mark. It means to, to, to aim for something and miss, right? So hmm. what are you missing the mark on? Um, that's, I don't say that to put pressure on you or to make you think you're going to be a terrible father if you're not perfect, because guess what? No one's going to be perfect. You're never going to get all your stuff handled. But what beautiful motivation to do your own work, to ask your own questions, to see a therapist if that's what you want. If there's stuff in your past that you want to work on, see a therapist and start to dive into that. If you want to plan a powerful future, start working with a coach. That's the work that I do. It's like I have people come to me all the time. Well, I, I already have a therapist. I'm like, great, great. Work on your past. Learn about yourself and why you are the way that you are now. But have someone that can help you move into the future in a powerful way and plan where you want to go from where you are now mm. and how important it is. It's like, you know, every, you know, what does every gold medal Olympic athlete have in common? They have a freaking coach, man. And they have a great coach. They have someone, the value of someone being able to tell me like you just did earlier on this call, right? Hey, Michael, you know, your, your microphone is kind of getting in your shirt. I didn't notice that, but you did. Hmm. So having eyes from the outside to be able to leverage, leverage someone else's brilliance onto your life to be able to help you improve and see the things you can't see. My God. I mean, that, that's, that's what you should do. 
and mm. you know acknowledge people acknowledge there's there's something again back to robert moore's book um, in the archetype of the king and in integrity in the archetype of the king which is the amalgam of all of the different archetypes king warrior magician lover are the traditional four but according to robert Bly, there are three others that don't often get talked about there's the wild man there's the the grief man and then there's the trickster mm. so the king being the integration of all of those and that what the king does is the king orders his kingdom so what in your kingdom is out of order what you know it's like it's the first chapter of peterson's book right we'll clean your room it's like the thing he gets kind of made fun of but also is known for like you want to change the world change your world first clean your own room what in your kingdom is out of order what you know you you're dating a new amazing woman do you have ex-partners that are sort of still hearting your facebook posts and like leaking energy into your relationship you know what can you do in your own world to um put your kingdom in integrity and then the other thing is to acknowledge the people is to acknowledge your your people so you see somebody doing something that you love let them know we get, we're so we're i'm i'm going i'm going to speak from the eye for this because this was it was and still is a big thing for me is that cult of comparison that mm -hmm. social media really really creates in a, in a negative way where it's all comparis, comparing each other to that that dude with the six pack and the lambo on that instagram post who's got all the stuff and he's doing all the things and it's like well fuck i i'm, I'm a failure compared to that mm. so there's this negative aspect of comparison that i think happens where in tribe in a lot of these men's communities we're working with working with healthy competition with how do we you know iron sharpens iron that's what we say in tribe so how can we um use each other to push off of each other and everyone gets stronger you know would kobe bryant have been as good as he was if he hadn't played against michael jordan earlier in his career i doubt it so it's those types of things it's like find find great men find find people that are smarter than you mm. and surround yourself with those people be the dumbest guy in the room you know if you're mm. the smartest guy in the room great that's good for your ego every now and then but you're not going to grow in that space so mm -hmm. acknowledge people around you acknowledge the young kids man let them know it's like you walk down the street you know and, and you see somebody you know pick up a piece of trash and put it in the trash can. yo thanks for doing that man i appreciate that you know, like let's talk to each other and realize that we're not all in this alone you know mm. the biggest revelation i see in the men's sharing circles that i do and the men's work that i do is guys hear someone else share about a struggle they're having and they're like what what I thought it was just me. I thought it was just me. It's not just you, brother. Whoever you are listening to the show, it is not just you. There are universal struggles that, that men are going through. And there are universal solutions and individual solutions that'll be right for you that are out there. Um, you just got to be willing to put yourself out there. You got to be willing to ask. And these opportunities are showing up more and more. Men's work is becoming more and more of a thing um, for, for mostly for good. <laughs> for sure yeah um, so yeah that's my answer to that question here you know we we kind of touched upon men's work and i'm curious where do you see this let's say movement this work being in the next i don't know four five six years it, it, it's become more and more prevalent to me the whole uh, uh you can call it attack on masculinity or you know a lot of uh, uh, guilt shame being put on men for being yeah. men and asking the men etc etc and this this movement, even men's work, wasn't even around at least for for what I know. And I'm happy to be stand corrected for the last maybe four or five years. It's where where it kind of began more uh, known as men's work. But before that, I know we had back in the '80s, Robert Bly, etc., yeah, etc. Yeah, KP and those guys. Yeah. Yeah. What What do you see the this work being in the next few years? Mm. <laughs> That's a great question. I think it's going to explode. Um, I think it's really going to explode and it's one of these things where it, it's absolutely a technology. Mm. That's absolutely the way I think about it. It is absolutely a technology. It's a simple technology, but it's a technology, but there is something that happens when you get men together in a group, like we were all doing for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, and thousands of years 
again, I don't care where your genetics come from, what your peoples come from. You go back far enough, this was, this was what was done. So there's something that happens when men gather together in the space and you work through a, it can, it can vary, but a, a specific set of tools to create a safe space, mm-hmm. to set intentions and to create vulnerability that allows men to share what their experience has been and to commiserate, corroborate, um, collaborate, and there's something that just happens. I mean, that's why I do this work. I do this work because I have no bloody choice, man. Like spirits, like you're going to do this. And then every time I'm in those rooms, I get, you know, drip fed dopamine from what I see happen, the transformations that I see happen of men getting permission. And again, the solidarity of, oh my God, you're going through that too? What? And that we can empower each other. I think and I think there's something to this, you know, in the, in the post me too moments, I think there's a lot, there's so many more men that want to do the right thing than there are these sort of negative stereotypes of the patriarchy, but men don't know what to do. I mean, women are rising, they're coming and yes, fuck yes, rise girl, fucking rise. And women are learning that, you know, they can do the things men do. Do they want to do that? Is that good for them? Does that line up with their biology? We're just learning this because women have only been in the workplace for 50 years. My goodness. But, you know, there's, there's just so much happening right now in the conversation. And, and as we know, men are opting out. Men are opting out. They're saying, well, if I'm going to get yelled at every time I stand up for myself, I'm just going to fuck. I'm just going to, I'm just going to back away. And as important as gay rights and trans rights and playing with this gender puzzle, it's important. It's important thing. And it's, and, 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 and I hope everyone listening to this knows what I mean when I say that this is an important piece and 99% of the people on this planet do identify with the binary. They identify as man or woman. And that's, that's 99% of the population. So, I don't think it's useful to throw that baby out with the bathwater. I think there are pieces of our society that need to be changed, that need to be updated, that need to be looked at and really, really looked at. There are some serious reckonings that need to happen in this country specifically um, that really, really need to happen. But alienating men is not a good idea, is not the, is not the way to solve that is not the way to solve that. Blaming men who themselves haven't done anything just because they're men doesn't solve anything. It just further alienates. And I understand it's a reactionary thing. Women have, I mean, you know, arguably been oppressed to some degree for most of what we know as history. Mm. And now they're, (laughs) they can do it all and do it, girl, do it. But that doesn't mean that men have to not do it. But you know, it can be tough when suddenly women are doing the things that men used to do. What, well, where do I go? Where, how do I do this? So mm. I think that's a piece that isn't being spoken about in, in the, the bigger, larger conversations that are happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of people want, a lot of people want to say, well, I, I don't care what men are doing because it's been about men for forever. So it's like, well, I mean, is it, <laughs> we're human beings, you know, men and women, we're, we're the same species, we're the same people. And there's so much to be gained from supporting each other than, than, than just focusing on, and yeah, focus on that. Let's clean some stuff up, but yeah, man, men are struggling. So I think, I think so much of the explosion of men's work is a, is a corollary, is a reaction to that. I think a lot of men are hearing the call men are wanting to be they're wanting to show up they're wanting to Mm. be the man they know they can be and again like i said we've all been struggling under the negative aspects of shadow patriarchal leadership not just women all of us have so i don't know that we've ever really seen integrated male leadership outside of like storybooks like you know what does that actually look like yeah you know, we have we have dr king we have you know gandhi we have a few of these one or two really um and i think even even they you know <laughs> even they're getting torn down lately you know because yeah gandhi had some shit with his wife that was kind of fucked up mm. <laughs> you know? mm. if you read the story 
so did Dr. King. A little yeah. stuff about women, but does that mean we throw the whole thing out? I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm. I really want to honor you for your very kind of mature perspective and you bringing in not just kind of this kind of duality based consciousness, whether, whether it's either this or that, there is a lot of nuances. It's obviously a very complex topic, very triggering topic as well for a lot of people, I think for yeah. some might argue for very good reasons. And of course, but um, yeah, I think trying to castrate men, you know, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, yeah, that's a that's a recipe for disaster, I think. But again, that's a that's a topic that I'm sure we can dive in. I'm also conscious of time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. I mean, I'm enjoying this conversation, and that is a whole other thing. And yeah, I mean, I I really resonate with that. I really I really resonate with the experience of feeling like I was castrated and mm. emasculated in a big way, not intentionally, not intentionally. My mom's an incredible woman, and I think there's something. I I first heard this from Teal Swan actually. Um, this sort of unconscious castrating of men by that sort of second wave feminist generation as a way of protecting themselves as a way of they were abused or they experienced some type of negative masculine quality. So they made darn sure that their, their boys weren't going to have that. But again, what got sacrificed was the ability to stand up for yourself, the ability to have a boundary though those aggressive masculine qualities that in the right context are really good and often sexy you know mm, so there we go yeah man well maybe we'll have to do this again sometime i'm trying to i've been working to get a podcast off the ground as well and when i when i do that i'd love to have you on and then it'll be your turn to <laughs> answer all you. the questions but thank yeah, you for sir. all the guys out there listening come on over to tribe you know tribemenscommunity.com um, we got a lot of amazing stuff happening right now the guys have got a three-month men's program that they're launching um, you can find my work at michaelbates.com. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a men's coach. I, I work with groups as well, ritual rites of passage. I help men in the, in the aspects of purpose, you know, business, uh, love, relationship, uh, self-mastery, those types of things. But um, there's, there's people out there doing what it is that's the medicine for you. Mm. Uh, and don't be afraid to dig. So. There we go. There we go. Man, there's so many other topics we can dive into perhaps on another episode. Maybe we can yeah, do part we'll do two. Yeah, part two. Yeah. One, one last question I always ask my guests is, was there something that you wanted me to ask that I didn't? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I can't mm -hmm. imagine what it could have been. I mean, their questions were great. Um, you have such a beautiful energy yourself. Um, and your enthusiasm really spills over into the, mm -hmm. into the work that you do. So I... I hope that you continue doing this. You're really gifted at it. And uh, Thank you, sir. you need more male voices out there, you know, mm. talking about this stuff and, and sharing. So thank you. I appreciate you, sir. The light in the owners, the light in you. All right. That's all we have for today, folks. Uh, please go check out uh, Michael's website, Tribe Men's Community. I can highly recommend them as well. I'll put all the, uh, the websites and links in the mm. show notes below. And oh, great. Yeah, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace. Fantastic.